So, Jonathan, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Um, I wanted to start by asking about your time in Iran uh, in 1979 during the Iranian Revolution. Um, you were, well, I suppose, first of all, you were, you were on the plane with Ayatollah Khomeini as he returned from Paris uh, out of exile to Iran. What was the sort of the atmosphere at, at that time? Well, on the plane, uh, the atmosphere was uh, distinctly divided. Uh, there was a smallish group of uh, of Western journalists, I think entirely American, French and British journalists. And um, we were very nervous indeed, uh, especially when the Ayatollah's spokesman came mm stood up on the on the seat and said we've just been told by radio that when we enter um Iran's airspace we're going to be shot down by the the uh, Shah's air force um but at the same time there was a quite a large number of of uh, revolutionary students who supported Khomeini and they were delighted because they thought they'd be martyred with their leader so there was sort of split split in the atmosphere. We were rather gloomy. The, they were they were disappointed because we weren't shot down, and we were deeply relieved. Um, but the atmosphere in Tehran that day was quite extraordinary, and I've seen it said that um, uh, it was the the biggest crowd in in human history. Mm. I don't know quite how anybody knows that, but. It was, a, but there was a crowd. Must have been a crowd of about three million in the streets, yeah. um, and that was extraordinary. You know, I, uh, to be in the in the presence of so many people and uh, all kind of rejoicing at what they thought was going to be the new wonderful era that was mm. going to open. Actually, it was a, a pretty tragic period uh, with the invasion by uh, Iraq and uh, um, the war that lasted eight years and all the disasters that followed. But on that one day, everybody was very happy. Um, people talk about that, that being the moment where the sort of the expression Sunni Shia relations starts to get used a lot more. And was, was that a, a, a moment at which um, be, the difference between Sunni and Shia was, was a fundamentally political one? Then. I think, I mean, of course, that that was true then. Um, but since uh, I Iran was 95 uh, percent Shia, the, the, that didn't really enter into the, 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 the any part of the of the revolutionary process. Um, it started really, I think, when uh, Saddam Hussein um, began the war. Uh, Saddam from a, a country which was n nominally Sunni. I mean, of course, we we later found out that Sunnis were in a minority in in Iran in Iraq. But the invasion was carried out really um, on a fairly kind of religious um, basis. But I think it wasn't until a little bit later, about 1982, really, that the outside world started to become much more aware of the the split between uh, Sunni and Shia, mostly because of what happened in Lebanon mm. uh, when there was um, open civil war, really following the uh, the Iraqi uh, the following the uh, Israeli invasion, um, which was uh, resisted in different ways by Sunnis and Shia, and uh, that that was I think when most kind of aware people started. To, uh, to 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 hear that the, and use expressions like Sunni and Shia, but you know there was a great deal of ignorance in 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 the Western world before that period, um, and that, well, I would say that continues to this day. Mm. And do, do you think there was <coughs> um, a marked change in Western perceptions of Islamic nations after that after that point? By which by by which I mean both by by, by governments and politicians, but also by the, the sort of average person on the street perception of, of the Middle East as well? Yes, I, I suppose so. Um, I, I think that, that most, most kind of ordinary, uh, uninvolved people um, thought of the Middle East in general as being a, a violent and um, fairly brutal yeah. area. They got their ideas from 
the particularly the Palestinian terrorism um, and Iran, although it didn't fit into that pattern exactly, nevertheless seemed to be a, a an angry, uh, violent area in which which was deeply anti-Western. And I think these these things kind of fed into each other and made people gave people the feeling that you know it was an area that was hostile to to the West. Not not true actually, uh, in many in many ways, but. Um, it was an easy kind of assumption to make somehow. And um, when, when we look at Iran today um, and its relations with, with other countries, um, can, we, can we trace those relations back to the, the revolution in, in 1979 or is there more at play now in terms of those relations? Uh, it's much more complicated now and public opinion is very, very different in Iran nowadays. Um, most uh, e educated uh, uh, or westernized people would, I think, have a, a, a favorable view of the West, perhaps an un unreasoningly favorable view. Um, and uh, wh whereas uh, for the government and the people that support the government, um, that hatred um, uh, and mistrust of particularly Britain and the United States, I think still mm. still continues. And so you have a um, you have a, a government which is very hostile, particularly to the to the United States, to a slightly lesser degree nowadays to Britain. Uh, but you have a lot of people who are actually very really rather well disposed to the West and perhaps always have been. Uh, but they're governed by by people with the opposite view. And just to sort of follow up on that, it seems to me that the Iran situation right now with regards to the coronavirus outbreak is a bit of a black box, so to speak, in terms of what's going on there. Do you think that these endemic issues are sort of mostly the fault or product of the governance, or do you think there's something more endemic about, say, the religious beliefs or the society? That no, I think out? what's happening there is that... Um, there is deep discontent within Iran, um, uh, hostility towards the government, and that the, the all sorts of things. I mean, wholly unrelated things. Uh, the rise in oil prices, mm. for instance, which was greeted with demonstrations in towns and cities throughout Iran, quite very hostile, very, became very anti-government mm. almost immediately. And then when the government tried to um, uh, to claim that it hadn't had anything to do with the shooting down of the Ukrainian airline, mm. um, that also brought remarkable uh, demonstrations onto the streets. And although, of course, the coronavirus is nobody's fault um, in, in Iran, nevertheless, it's affecting the government there quite badly. The government showing is really bad. If you remember the deputy minister of health appearing on television with the virus and mopping his brow and coughing the whole time, um, it makes the government look ludicrous and uh, inadequate. And although... I suppose at the moment this is not exactly a very good time for people to come out on the streets in large numbers. You can bet that when it is when it does become possible for them to to come out, they they will do that. And I would guess, but it can only be a guess, that at some stage this kind of of pressure on the government, public uh, street pressure, mm. will start to have a, an effect on on the way that it's governed. Yeah, I was just wondering on that point, more generally, do you think the coronavirus outbreak is going to be, in many ways, a shock to governments all around the world, not just Iran, right? So you've got the Chinese government sort of reacting initially with this sort of silencing approach, now followed by sort of staunch and, in many ways, I guess, efficacious lockdown measures. But on the other hand, in Italy, or even here in the UK and USA, these governments seem to be sort of caught off guard. And Where do you think, or what's your prognosis in terms of where the epidemic's going to go? Do you think it's going to pose a fundamental challenge to governance? I, I think it is, uh, but it depends on where. Um, in in the United States, uh, it's clear that already 
the Democratic Party sees its big opportunity in kind of hanging the coronavirus around Donald Trump's neck yeah. and his kind of laissez-faire, laid-back attitude, oh, it's not all that bad, uh, it, it, it's, and then, you know, it's all got up by the media, that kind of, of attitude and, and slow response will not look good, will not go down yeah. well and may very, very well, I think, uh, have, a, have an effect on the November election. Mm. Um, in Britain, uh, I think uh, it, it depends. I'm not entirely sure what the government is going to do because it's only, it hasn't announced it yet, but it does look as though it also is not going to take very, very tough measures. And I, I suspect that the best way to deal with these things is to be more tough than necessary at the start and then, um, um, you know, as as was done as has been done really in a variety of places i mean hong kong china itself has been i think pretty successful actually after as you say after a bad start yeah. uh taiwan has been remarkably uh, good um singapore also yeah. um and after a, a a rocky start also south korea and i think those countries are going to benefit and the countries which kind of seem to have put their feet up yeah. will 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 suffer i don't include italy in that i think italy has taken quite brave uh steps and yeah. ireland is now doing the same and denmark the yeah. same and i think those governments will benefit and the ones that didn't will will suffer um and just just lastly um you've talked about you talked recently about the um the the, the bbc being under threat and new uh, models being presented as to how it could be managed and financed. Um, I guess, what, what's your response to some people, perhaps in some cases younger people, who compare who, who could compare BBC perhaps to a subscription service like Netflix and say, well, why can't, why can't we pay it in that way rather than be made to pay it via the licence fee? Well, I mean, there's two points about that. One is Netflix only goes in for entertainment, mm. doesn't go in for the enormous range of educational and informative stuff that the BBC does, doesn't have any news, for instance, and the news is one of the most expensive things about the BBC. So it's not possible to say, oh, well, you know, just let's, uh, let we can rely on, mm. on Netflix or anything remotely like it. Uh, no, no, uh, I don't think any country could uh, could do that. And you had to bear in mind also that um, Netflix runs an enormous deficit. It's it's run on debt in a way that I, I don't think most ordinary organisations could could manage. And it's only because people keep have a uh, an idea about Netflix's future prospects that they're they're prepared to to put the money up now. So Netflix is not a national broadcaster. And in a sense, it's an entertainment channel, which, um, you know, is, is, is actually, I think, very good. But it, it, there's no question that the BBC could, could just simply become a kind of Netflix, or at least I don't, I don't think so. I don't think any government, yeah. even, even a sort of um, Dominic Cummings government, could see that, uh, could think that that was uh, in any way a good, a good thing. Um, I mean, I I feel personally that the the, the Germany um, runs these things a great deal better. After the Second World War, uh, British advisers went uh, and Amer and American advisers went to Germany and sorted out different areas of the economy and and. Uh, uh, public life and one of the areas that Britain was involved in was in recreating the, the um, um, broadcasting system um, and they they of course learned from all the mistakes mm. that that Britain had made and instead of uh, funding it on a on a license fee basis which you were paid separately and uh, which you had strong could have strong feelings about it's all done through through taxation through an impartial and independent body 
uh, in the in the the originally West German government and now in the German government, which simply allocates the fees and 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 ensures the balance of of the the various broadcasters and people pay it in their in their taxes and aren't aware of it. So there's no hostility whatever in Germany to public uh, service broadcasting. Um, I mean, any any um, rational country is going to want to have a, a broadcaster, and the more rational the country, the more likely that that broadcaster is going to be uh, an independent, allowed to be independent. Um, I think, in some ways, the a bigger threat is the possibility that the the current government might think about introducing might uh, might lift the restrictions the ofcom restrictions mm. on broadcasters to be balanced just as the US did in 19 was it 88 I can't remember uh, lifted the restrictions on on the broadcasters to to provide political balance mm. with the result that we have now fox news and all the 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 chaos, really, that that exists in um, in 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 the U.S., where broadcasting companies just basically choose their sides and broadcast about them, um, that I think would be a, a a real failure. One of the great things about Britain, I I would say, is that the broadcasting the broadcasters are so well controlled and broadcast stuff that is so well balanced i mean sky and itv and channel 4 news and and the bbc i think that's an excellent model and any country which any government which thought about following the american model would be absolutely crazy mm. but um i mean if whatever the future model of the bbc is it's clear that it it might not have the same financial means as it does today mm. and if that's the case where where does the axe fall first? I suppose what what does it what does it get rid of? Does it try and um, insulate the news wing or or drop the entertainment stuff or, or what what does it do? Well, assuming it's still got a charter, which which I, I I'm sure it will have, um, it will be obliged to to have a full news service. That's that's the kind of fundamental of the charter itself. Always has been uh, right from from the start. So news can certainly be chopped back. I mean, it's already being chopped back very heavily. I think we're losing, uh, I think I'm right in saying, £90 million out of our, the news budget this year, which is pretty, pretty fierce. Um, but, uh, you know, we are still required to have a full news service. Mm. I think the questions will then come about, for instance, local radio um, and... Um, no doubt, these are old, old chestnuts that that, that are, are pulled out. I mean, do you pull out chestnuts? I can't think. But but uh, every every uh, time there's a, an issue about you know how the BBC spends its yeah. money, and of course what, what what happens is that you know people who want uh, um, um, pop music say, well, whatever happens, you can't cut that. And people that want classical music say you can't cut Radio Three. People that everybody has something they like about the BBC and want to want to keep, which is one of the problems about cutting back on it. Um, but, uh, yes, I think we will still have some sort of licence fee in, 90, in 2027 when the new charter will come into force. But I think there'll be a subscription basis also, and part of the money will come from subscription and the BBC will have to shrink accordingly it can't carry on um, it won't be I don't suppose it'll be earning three point whatever it is billion a year and um, it'll it'll have to uh, come to terms with less less uh, putting out less money and one of the issues I feel that a lot of some news around the world in particular I guess to some extent BBC as well is facing is just a lot of allegations and scepticism from folks that accuse it of being fake news and you see the rise of actual fake news that propagates the claim that mainstream media are perpetuating sort of false information disseminating fake news in that sense how do you think sort of these mainstream or established media outlets can regain the confidence of both the general public and also in particular those individuals that feel as if the voices or the views were not represented 
by these mainstream outlets in a way that allows for the genuine decline of real fake news in a medium to long run. Oh, it's very difficult, uh, very difficult indeed to regain confidence after it's been so badly lost. I mean, I would say that uh, it isn't just broadcasting, it's, it's uh, government, uh, it's government uh, in general. And I think in this country, it stemmed from the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, all the business about the weapons of mass destruction created a kind of cynicism about what the government was doing. Mm. And, and that extended into cynicism about uh, what the, I'm sorry about this, about what the broadcasters were doing. So, uh, you know, that is, that is something which, I mean, you know, which is very, very difficult to turn around. How do politicians turn it around? Don't know, actually. Uh, how do broadcasters turn it around? Well, all I can think is that um, the better the political leadership, the easier it will be to show people that politicians aren't just a bunch of um, uh, are more than just perhaps a, a bunch of uh, self-interested uh, bastards who are, are you know, um, uh, happy to sell anybody down the, down the river. And the broadcasters are going to have to just up their game and to be, show themselves to be more reliable. And it's, it's, it's hard because, I mean, I would say hand on heart that my colleagues feel that their game is pretty high anyway and if this is yeah. the way that that uh, that it goes well you know that is that is very depressing I mean, one th there are radical ways uh, to do it i mean i do think that um this is partly because of the the sort of 24 hour news cycle where everybody is rushed everybody is stretched mistakes are easily easily made and everybody assumes that those mistakes are absolutely deliberate and and come from the core of the organization you know when when in fact it's somebody that hasn't had enough sleep or enough time or isn't properly trained enough who's just whatever it may be said the use the wrong word yeah. put the wrong label on or made a bad edit but those so it, it I mean it's not uh, unthinkable in my terms that we should think about, um, uh, you know, uh, cutting back on the amount of news that we broadcast in order to, to improve the quality of it. And it may well be that these two things will come together, and having less money will make that an easier choice to, uh, to make.